From WAMU 88.5 at American University in Washington, welcome to the Kojo Nan, the show connecting your neighborhood with the world. It's opening day in just over four hours. The Washington Nationals kick off their 2015 season in front of a sold-out crowd of 41,888 with high hopes of another run to the postseason and beyond. Ten years after the return of baseball to the nation's capital, the professional game is clearly thriving, but the picture is more complicated at the amateur and little league levels. When Major League Baseball came back to the district, the sport pledged to re-engage with inner-city communities that had seemed to turn away from the national pastime. This past month, a gleaming new baseball complex opened in Fort DuPont, east of the river, and a new little league named after Mamie Pina Johnson, the first female pitcher to play in the Negro Leagues, recently opened in Ward 7. But deep structural challenges remain for a sport that requires 18 kids, umpires, coaches, and parents to succeed. This hour, we're exploring the health of baseball in the district and whether it's possible to use sports as a tool to strengthen communities. And joining us in studio to have this conversation is Tal Alter. He is the executive director of the Washington National Youth Baseball Academy. Tal Alter, thank you for joining us. It's my pleasure to be here. Also with us is Lauren McCoy. Lauren is head coach of Howard University's softball team. Lauren, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. And Paris Enman is a longtime Little League coach, organizer, and Little League parent now responsible for community involvement with the Washington Grays. What's the Washington Grays? The D.C. Grays. The D.C. R-A- Grays. Are <laughs> a collegiate uh, summer baseball team. Uh, college baseball players from around the country uh, come to D.C. They volunteer their time. They coach kids, and they play in the in the Calvert and Senior League, which has teams from all over the DMV and other other places. When baseball came to the district ten years ago this month, Major League Baseball, which owned the Nationals at the time, pledged not just to bring a Major League franchise to the district for the first time in three decades, but also to help reinvigorate baseball at the amateur and youth level. So my first question for all of you, starting with you, Paris, is how healthy is the sport right now? I think it's growing. Uh, I'll use the Little League has about 3,500 players playing around the city. I think we have an opportunity to grow it by about that many players, and 60 to 80 percent of that opportunity uh, will be new players east of the river meaning opportunities that exist for Mamie Johnson and Southern District Little League and Ward 8. That's where most of the growth needs to come, and Ward 5. And what's Ward your, 5 as What's well. your thinking, Laura? Uh, I think that I'm um, going to have to agree with him that I think it is growing. Uh, from a female perspective, when we're talking about softball, I think that it is uh, definitely in its infancy in terms of there is uh, definitely – uh, interest, um, but knowledge of the game and, and really just being introduced to the game of softball in general is it's fairly new. And you, tell? Well, uh, since I'm over in Ward 7 every day with the Youth Baseball Academy, and we did open uh, a year ago, actually, in March, uh, I, I actually think we've, we're seeing the beginning of, of the game uh, and, and a thriving game uh, Here in, Washington. In, in this city. And, you know, that's, that's evidenced by uh, the year-round program that we run, which is really focused on youth development with baseball and softball as the vehicle. Uh, and it's a great teaching tool, and I'm sure we'll get into that during the conversation. But the, the problem I see is not the game itself. The, the children love to be around the game. It's providing the opportunities to play. 800-433-8850 is the number here if you'd like to join the conversation with a question or comment. 800-433-8850. How healthy is the sport of baseball in the city and its surrounding areas in your view? Has baseball lived up to its promises to revitalize baseball in the inner city? You can also shoot us an email to kojo at wamu.org or a tweet at Kojo Show. You can go to our website, kojoshow.org, ask a question or make a comment there. Tal, as you said, we discussed this some more. If you build it, they will come. That's what they say, right? Last, um, the Washington Nationals Youth Baseball Academy opened a brand new facility at Fort DuPont in Ward 7, which you helped to run. Mm-hmm. Is the riddle 
of reviving baseball as simple as building a gleaming new $18 million facility? Tell us about the plan for this complex. No, it's not, it's not the only uh, answer to that riddle. But it's a very important part of the, the puzzle. And, you know, I, I'm really excited that Paris and, and Lauren are here to, to be in this conversation because they can speak to that question as well. Uh, I think we are building a model for something that that can grow. We can build best practices around it, and uh, I think it can be replicated in other places. But we're excited because we have a chance to get it uh, done right here in D.C. first. So our focus, like I said before, is, is youth development. Baseball and softball are our vehicles for doing that. We are focused on academic enrichment, on improved health and wellness, psychosocial and physical. Uh, and we're also talking about character development and the, the building of positive character traits through participation in sport. Uh, we are able, unlike most, there, there are hundreds of great organizations doing a lot of the same type of work that we do right here in D.C. and thousands across the country. We have that facility, like you said, and as a result, people are drawn to us. Uh, we have the chance to run a year-round after school and, and summer program for, for children. Uh, elementary school and middle school students, all Ward 7, Ward 8 residents. They're there almost 150 days a year. But we also have more than 350 competition uh, games, softball, baseball, happening at the Academy of the Summer, Howard University, the DC Grays, Mamie Johnson Little League. And that's bringing more than 10,000 people through the facility in the heart of Ward 7. Uh, and that's why I said before that I don't think the problem that exists in lack of participation is with the game itself. People are excited to be around the game. It's building the structures and the support systems within that. Coaches being an instrumental part, the instrumental part in my opinion, and I know that uh, these two believe that too. Uh, and we would like to be uh, the convener in making sure that, that that happens here in D.C. and bringing good people together, a lot of good people doing great work already uh, through this terrific facility and, and the support of, of the hometown team too. Lauren, as the head coach of the Howard University softball team, a good chunk of your time is spent recruiting. And perhaps it tells us something about the health of amateur baseball and softball in this area that you don't tend to find many of your athletes here in the district, right? That's correct. Um, unfortunately, the majority of my team uh, comes from the West Coast and from the Southern states. And I would love to be able to recruit right out of D.C. I would love to be able to recruit locally. Unfortunately, um, when you're talking about playing at a Division One level, um, overall, uh, I think the desire is there. I think that uh, the academic talent is there. But when you're talking about uh, just uh, having the skill level to play um, Division One softball, um, it's not it's not here in the city yet. Um, I think there's certainly some players. Uh, that have that ability, but I think overall, uh, it's just it's just not available at, at this point. Paris, this is really a complex story because for every story of gloom and doom that we can hear about the lack of amateur sports, there's a story about a guy like a Paris Inman who just decides to start his own little league. Tell us about how you got involved in amateur baseball. I was uh, I was a father of a five year old kid who could throw a Nerf ball across the living room and. And I thought I was raising the next... <laughs> Satchel <laughs> Page. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> Ian Desmond. <laughs> right. <laughs> and, and exactly what I did was I taught him about Satchel Page. And I taught him about the fact that we lived around the corner from the old Griffith Stadium where his mother worked at Howard University Hospital. I told him about Chuck Hinton who coached at Howard University and I brainwashed the kid. <laughs> and the next thing I did, you admit it. Yes, I do. <laughs> the other thing I did was we went around the corner to the Gage Ekinson School. We met with the principal. We met with other people in the community. And this all resulted from the fact that I was trying to find this kid a place to play t-ball. And the diamonds that were in immediate, uh, immediately close to where I lived at that time had needles and bottles and other things in the backstop. And I just got some neighbors together and we cleaned up the field. We started going to community meetings and I got the help of a lot of great prominent neighbors. I lived across from Walter Washington. I lived across from Jesse Jackson and those people helped me. And my son was on the bullhorn as we drove through the neighborhood saying, come sign up for baseball. And everybody helped. And I was not a baseball coach. I was doing something called community organizing. And I didn't know that. I was really 
very selfishly trying to find a place for this prodigy to play <laughs> <laughs> that I was raising. At least I thought he was at that time. He's doing great. He's playing baseball in college now, and I'm excited about that. However, there are lots of other kids that got involved in that process, and I like to think that, um, that I found a sport and an activity that can make a difference, and um, I think it has. Well, um, Lauren can tell you the impact of her coaching on kids. And so I did that for a period of time. I went from being a little league, I went to being a little league organizer, district administrator. I served on boards, helped out with travel teams, and it became sort of a uh, something a way of life, like, a way of life <laughs> for a period of time. In fact, I took off some time recently, and I'm back in it as a community involvement uh, 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 head for DC for Grace DC Collegiate Grace. Team. Exactly. You mentioned Walter Washington. He was the first, late Walter Washington, right. was the first elected mayor of right. Washington. Mm -hmm. You mentioned Jesse Jackson. He was for a while a statehood mm -hmm. senator right. from the District of Columbia. Right. The important thing is that they both lived on the corner of 4th and T Street Northwest. And so I that's lived at the, 4th and T. <laughs> that's the neighborhood that you're right. talking exactly. yeah. about. Yeah. The new facility at Fort DuPont isn't the only development in mm -hmm. local baseball. Mm -hmm. We mentioned a new little league recently opened in Ward 7. Named after a local baseball legend, Mamie mm -hmm. Peanut Johnson, mm -hmm. the first female pitcher to play in the Negro Leagues back in the 1950s. You should know that back in September of 2009, we had the honor of talking with Peanut. Here she is talking about how she got the baseball bug. I started pitching in South Carolina. Oh, I guess I was about seven, eight years old, throwing rocks and whatever, you know, and we were making our own baseballs then, you know, with a with twine and the stone and and uh, Mexican tape, the heavy Whoa. tape. Yeah, so it, it, it wasn't a big thing. Baseball can be a bit of a boys club. How did you go about building relationships and earning respect from the men that you shared the dugout with? Well, actually, that's with anything. If you know that you can do something, you prove yourself regardless of who you're with. And that I had to do. And once I proved myself, I, I had no problems. It, it was easy after that. Once they found out that she could play, she had no problems. Paris, you were at the dedication for this league. Why is it important? Uh, well, first, that was a fantastic event. Uh, Mamie had her family. It was important to her. And the first thing she said is she wants to make sure Ward 7 has a team playing in Pennsylvania, as she said it. Uh, and that was exciting to see. Secondly, it's important because what you, ha like any other sport, you've got to assemble lots of people from several generations. You've got I mean, generations. You've got to get the old and the young working together. If you go to a community and you see 18 kids playing, uh, an umpire, two coaches, a manager, team moms, concessions. If you see that going on, I will tell you that that is one step in the right direction for a positive neighborhood and a positive community. That's what it takes. Uh, Mamie probably didn't mention why she went through those issues, but I'm sure she can name lots of adults and lots of other people that got involved. My experience was I rolled the balls out, I brought some bats out, some helmets and some equipment, and the kids were attracted to it like crazy. This is not a kid problem. This is an issue of Major League Baseball has an opportunity to market to our communities. We have an opportunity to get community-minded people to understand that if I can pull off a baseball league in my community, I can solve lots of problems in terms of people working together, communicating, just because we're, it's baseball, is it's more than a game. It's, it's more than that when you're organizing at the community level. Got to get to this before we go mm -hmm. to a break, because mm -hmm. all last year we're talking about baby Pina Johnson, all mm -hmm. last year... Mm -hmm. A different female, fireball-throwing pitcher, captured the national attention. Monet Davis of the Jackie Robinson West team from Chicago took the Little League World Series by storm and perhaps brought more attention to baseball in the inner city. The story of Jackie Robinson West is complicated, though the team had its national championship stripped of it by Little League Baseball in February after it said the team had recruited players outside of the neighborhood boundaries. What was your takeaway from that story? Well, um... Two things. First, Again, it wasn't about the kids. So. <laughs> well, first, um, there are at least two or three stories that I'm familiar with from Washington, D.C., of girls being among the best players on their teams. I know that Wilson High School had a young lady that shunned softball to play baseball, and she was a very good pitcher, one of the best on their team in the post, and I think maybe you, it was mentioned on your show before. Mm -hmm. So 
as it relates to Little League, it's not that unusual to see, and that young lady is fantastic in every way. It's not unusual to see great female athletes competing and winning among the boys. I think she's just a, a great example to, to, to show light on the fact that that's happening in Little League all the time. Second, um, as it relates to, to the, it's very difficult, as I said, to organize leagues in the city. When I saw the story, I wasn't so certain. I don't think my first thought was adults behaving badly because I was impressed with those 12-year-old boys and how they spoke and how they played and how they knew the game. They clearly knew the game. And I was impressed by that. What I understand, though, is like you said, somebody really wanted to win, but they had, the game had already been won. Assembling those boys and playing baseball, there's some rules associated with, but I just need people to, to take look back at those kids, be impressed with those kids, don't change their impressions of that. Winning, that's, that's an adult drug. <laughs> Lauren? <laughs> Uh, I, I have to agree. Uh, when I when I turned on the TV and and saw those those boys playing, um, really young men, and really what what really stuck out to me with that was just the support that they had from their community watching at home, and how it can just invigorate and just bring such incredible excitement. So I, I think the uh, what happened afterwards is unfortunate, but I think that uh, just seeing them play together, I mean, it was an inspiration for my collegiate team. Right. Um, to see them competing. So, Tal? I think that this has been touched on already. Paris talked about winning being an adult drug. The, the Mamie Johnson uh, anecdote about creating her own baseball, <laughs> that just doesn't happen anymore in any sport, really. Mm, yeah. the, the youth sports landscape as a whole has changed dramatically. And as a result, it's relying more and more heavily on the types of things that Paris is talking about, community organizing, volunteer parents, structures that are in place. And I think when you're talking about baseball and baseball's disappearance from our inner city and other inner cities, that is one of the key ingredients that's been missing. The academy wants to fill that void in, in many different ways. Again, the facility itself draws people, but we also have the unique opportunity to be a convener. We have the full support of the Washington Nationals as, uh, as a support structure behind that. But to create a cohort of young people, coach apprentices, if you will, uh, that can be trained, first of all identified, secondly trained, and then supported for the long term, something that's sustainable. And it's not a kid problem. Paris How do you talks do that? that? How do you go about developing a roster of great coaches? You all seem to believe that coaches are critical, that they're the linchpin for developing an organic baseball culture, culture. But how do you go about developing a roster of great coaches? Well, it's hard to do. It's hard to do. But, you know, we, we think we can do it. And we've seen... We have Anacostia High School who uses our facility as their home field. They don't have their own field at, at Anacostia. They, they have to play on a football field if they play over there. They come to our place. They, it's their place, frankly, too. They had eight kids come out for baseball last year. They had to scrape to get a ninth to come out. This year they had more than 20 come out for their team. And now many of these kids, 15, 16, 17 years old, they hadn't played a lot of baseball. And baseball is a sport that will expose you if you haven't played. So part of the thing is what Paris is talking about. We've got to start young. The academy is working with, with children as, as early as eight in our after-school program, and we want to help with that t-ball infrastructure. But you've got to find those high school kids that are passionate about being out there. Mm -hmm. You have to give them opportunities to coach. Mm -hmm. You have to put them in front of young people who idolize them just by virtue of being around them and seeing them as high school cool kids, and then you give them the, the infrastructure to, to be a part of something really positive, and that can grow and build upon itself. The training that you provide then has to be really good, and there has to be a culture that is intentionally created, maintained, uh, and, and you have to walk the walk. You have to walk the talk uh, as well. Got to take a short break. When we come back, we'll continue this conversation on youth baseball, but still encouraging your calls at 800 Four three three eight eight five zero is winning an adult drug, an adult problem. How would you assess the health of kids sports leagues more broadly? Eight hundred four three three eight eight five zero. You can send email to kojo at wamu dot org. I'm Kojo Nandi. Hey. Me out to the ball game, take me out with the crowd, buy me some peanuts and crackers, Jack, 
Welcome back. We're talking youth baseball and inviting your calls at 800-433-8850. Do you think organized sports can be used as a tool to foster community or not? Give us a call, 800-433-8850. We're talking with Paris Inman. He's a longtime Little League coach, organizer, and Little League parent, now responsible for community involvement with the D.C. Grays. Tal Alter is the executive director of Washington National Youth Baseball Academy, and Lauren McCoy is head coach of Howard University's softball team. We were talking about coaches, Lauren. Did you have a particularly influential coach growing up? What makes a good coach? Uh, I've had several, Um, and I was fortunate to grow up in Southern California, which is essentially the hotbed for this sport. And so coming into uh, the district, I uh, I really wasn't familiar with the culture of, of specifically softball um, here. And so one of the things that's been incredibly important to me is is growing a better foundation and a better structure for softball um, because it is different from baseball um, and it is for us girls. And so I think uh, having the opportunity to work at the academy uh, having my girls there to mentor uh, the young ladies at the uh, Nationals Academy has just had a profound effect on uh, my girls. And, and hopefully we're making a positive impact on the young ladies at the Academy as well. Paris, tell today, black athletes make up just around 8% of major league baseball rosters. And at the collegiate level, it's only 2.6% of Division One mm-hmm. programs. Major League Baseball has repeatedly said it wants to address that decline in participation by African American African Americans. Paris, I'll start with you as a black man, a father. I'm curious how you view those numbers. What you make of the relatively low participation rate of black kids? Um, in the course of, of educating my kids in this sport, one of the things I did is I took them to uh, the Dominican Republic in the, during a Christmas vacation. And we watch kids with no gloves, no shoe, no shoes, uh, who love the game. And I'm sure we went to a field. We saw a lot of their fathers and older brothers, who were demonstrating their love for the game. And I'm sure those guys learned it. So one of the things that has to happen is the game's got to get passed down. It's got to get passed down. There's got to be people like Lauren and Tall and Paris who played the game. Uh, actually, I didn't play the game, but who, who love the game, passing it, passing down a love of the game. Some of that's strictly Major League Baseball needs to direct some marketing of its game to communities of color and to inner city communities. They've got to decide that I'm going to do some direct marketing. I'm going to create some fans by helping them understand how fun this game is. It's all like that will do a lot to create ball players. Secondly. And every one of the players in the major leagues can play a role by simply making themselves available in various ways through the academies, programs, or others to a lot of these kids. I have direct experience with older boys, teaching younger boys, fathers teaching sons, mothers teaching sons and daughters, these games that we're talking about, softball and baseball. That just, we just have to create opportunities to have that happen more and more and more. And in cases where there is no parent, we've got to have programs that enthusiastically take the game and use it to teach life's lessons. There's lots of them to learn. Just the whole lesson of how you get a league started and community involvement, I'm expecting, fully expecting my children to give back in the way that they've seen me give back. Same thing with playing the game. So you had no problem with your son being better than you from the moment he started playing? Oh, he was better than me. From, well, I, well, now that from the you said that, he, he's listening online from college, and I'm sorry you said that, but yes, he's better than me. He's better than me. From the get. Yes, from the get. Kyle, Major League Baseball has been talking about this issue for more than a decade. Mm-hmm. It has a program that it has touted in commercials for over 10 years called RBI, Reviving Baseball in the Inner Cities. Mm -hmm. And yet some cynics might argue that many of these efforts have been more about marketing than they have been about substance. Mm -hmm. In some ways, your academy is trying something new and different from previous efforts. Talk about what baseball has learned since it began trying to tackle this issue. Well, uh, first let me say I've had the opportunity to meet Commissioner Manfred, who's actually in town today and Mm -hmm. throwing out the first pitch at today's game. Uh, oh, by the way, that's the way, reason I'm wearing my Washington National oh, shirt. Happy opening day to you. I threw out the first pitch of the game two years ago. It was supposedly the best first pitch ever thrown <laughs> in Major League Baseball, or the worst. I don't remember which. <laughs> but go, go, go ahead, please. I'm sure it was not the worst. Uh, so, you know, I think I can't speak to what Major League Baseball 
has or hasn't learned uh, in that time. What I can speak to is the conversations I've had since the time I've been in this role, which has now been two years. And we are taking what, what I think is a uh, unique approach to addressing this issue. And I say that while I also want to say we're not trying to address the issue of Major League Baseball players. Uh, that's that to me is part of a process right. that starts at a very young age. Mm -hmm. It's a youth sports issue as we've discussed. We are taking a youth development approach to working with young people holistically. Health, wellness, uh, that's nutrition and baseball and softball. It's academic enrichment, it's psychosocial uh, wellness. And if, if you're doing youth development well and you're taking the best practices of great organizations like Higher Achievement, which was uh, founded right here in Washington, D.C., which we have, like Harlem RBI up in New York City, uh, then you're going to be developing strong young people, major league people. Mm -hmm. And if they're around the game, and the game is a, a terrific tool to teach those life lessons, they're going to keep playing the game. And if you have some athletic ability, then you're going to be in a position to play the game for a long time. And, and that's what we want to do. So people used to ask John Wooden, how's your team this year? And he would say, ask me in 10 years and I'll tell you. Mm -hmm. And that's sort of how I feel about the academy today. You know, I think you see the seedlings of it. Will we have eight-year-olds today who are drafted 10 years from now? I think it's possible, but I'm not going to measure our success that way. It's are they graduating from high school? Are they happy, healthy people? Are they good friends and family members? Uh, and if, if, if we do that well, then the other things will happen as a result, I think. Please down your headphones because we're about to hear from Aaron, who is in New Orleans, Louisiana. Aaron, you're on the air. Go ahead, please. Hello. Uh, hello, I'm Aaron. Uh, I'm actually uh, Paris and his son uh, calling in. <laughs> oh, so, yes, uh, the one who played better than he was from the start. <laughs> yeah. He should be in class <laughs> yeah. right now. I appreciate you, bro, for putting that out there. <laughs> um, I actually uh, wanted to talk about the importance of coaches. Uh, just... In, in my personal experience, just me and my brother, um, of course, our first coach was, was our dad, definitely. Um, I, I just, I, I remember just from hearing, going over, going through the neighborhood and doing all the uh, recruiting for the new Little League, I actually thought we were doing like a parade, like we had one something, but <laughs> actually it was just promoting for the new Little League, and in hindsight, it just, uh, I see like how important it is, <clears throat> especially with the new changes in the city and everything, um, but this coach is, in my in in my career throughout the city just helped me stay stay like uh stay involved in the game and and continue to love it uh just because the as well as baseball being fun and being a way for people to, to connect it's also a sport that you're always going to have to keep improving in and to have coaches that are adamant about their player success is going to make the player is more adamant about being successful in the game and then whatever they have to do to continue playing, such as doing well in school or making sure that they're on top of everything. And in some cases, that, that definitely helps uh, change a lot of people's academic lives uh, as well as their, their sports careers um, in terms of some people who might not have thought about going to college but think about going to college because they want to continue playing baseball because they love it so much. Um, and definitely, that was not the situation for me. I I always knew that I wanted to go to college and and take the steps after that. But uh, but definitely. And Aaron, where are you? In, where are you in school now? I'm at Loyola University <clears throat> in New Orleans. What year? Uh, freshman. Freshman. Oh, so you're just getting started out. Hmm. Well, thank you very much for your He's call. Just waking up, coach. Huh? <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> thank you very much for your call. Your dad says you have to be back in class so we can let you go. But thank you very much for your contribution to the conversation. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Keep up the good work, Aaron. <laughs> Care to comment at all, Inman? Uh, Paris? Other than class time? Yeah. I, I, I really <laughs> think coaches play an important role. Um, uh, my son was a part of a network that I didn't create. Uh, people like Antoine Williams, Gerard Hall, Keith Stubbs, uh, the Gibbs brothers at St. John's, but Chris Rodriguez. I could go on all day. Denise at uh, in, in BCC Baseball, the folks at Cap City, uh, Harry Thomas. I could go on all day about the coaches who impacted my son. He wanted to quit when he was 18 years old, when he was eight years old, because he got tired of striking out. And some coach, not his dad, said, hey, you know, keep trying. 
you know, keep trying. You need somebody to do that. Uh, uh, you need somebody to do that in any of these pursuits, be it music, be it basketball or football. You need motivated adults to connect with kids, pass the game down, teach life lessons, and ultimately support and reinforce them. And uh, there's a community of people around baseball that I'm excited about and that I'm uh, these presidents, uh, these little league volunteers, they make a difference in a lot of kids' lives. And all of these efforts, the academy, I'd like the academy to be the centerpiece in assembling these kinds of people who are community organizers at heart, coaches, et cetera, and they'll make a difference in hundreds of kids' lives. We established that number. We need 3,000 more Little League players. Let's go to work and support you. You got this posting from John on Facebook. Mm -hmm. D.C. has never been a baseball town like mm -hmm. Baltimore. Mm -hmm. It's a sport you have to learn young, much like mm -hmm. soccer. Mm -hmm. I know MLB is putting money here. That might help. But unlike soccer, baseball commits kids to most of the summer. Is there what you have observed here, Lauren McCoy or Tal Alter, a cultural change that needs to take place if indeed baseball has to commit kids for most of the summer? It's presumably how you spend a lot of your summers. Uh, in, in California, playing club ball, I played 48 out of 52 weekends. Oh, well, that's uh, a year round in yeah, California. In California, certainly. But uh, I think when you're just talking about trying to create a culture of softball, in my case, or baseball, uh, it really does require a tremendous amount of parental involvement. And I think uh, when, to, to go back to why coaches are important, uh, coaches are the ones that make it fun. They're, make, they're the ones that are supposed to make it engaging. And really, I know 40% of uh, the players on my team uh, come from single-parent homes, and their fathers are not in the picture. And so their coaches uh, really were transformative for them in that instead of going the way – um, statistically that they could have gone, uh, they ended up uh, going to college, a lot of them on full rides, and earning a degree from one of the elite universities in the country. And really that just boils down to um, having positive coaching influences in their lives. So I think in order to create the culture, I think it does start with the coaching and um, and and with the parents. Well, Tal, within broader American culture, it seems like amateur sports are really in the kind of glass half full, glass half empty situation. On the one hand, there are more organized sports leagues than ever and opportunities for talented kids to develop skills. But on the other, we seem to have lost something along the way. It doesn't seem like we see pickup games of baseball anymore. In this age of helicopter parents and so much organizations, do kids still just play the game for fun on their own anymore? Uh, it's a problem. Mm -hmm. It's a real problem. Mm -hmm. And that started, you know, I'm 39. Uh, mm -hmm. I was sort of right at the age where that started to change. There wasn't travel baseball when I was in high school, but now it's all there is really in the summer. That's the only opportunity. And Andrew McCutcheon, the center fielder for the Pittsburgh Pirates and arguably the best all-around mm -hmm. player in the game right now, wrote a terrific article about the, the cost of the game and how hard it is to access uh, playing baseball because it's so expensive. Uh, but, you know, I think... You talk about does it require the whole summer. I'm not a proponent of, of playing one sport. I think playing multiple sports is a great way to develop uh, hand-eye coordination and, and to, re, uh, to avoid repetitive stress injuries, and that, that's a problem that we see a lot of today. Mm -hmm. uh, but kids will vote with their feet. Uh, if they are going somewhere where they are having fun, they are going to keep coming back. So the coach's job is not to create the, most, uh, uh, the winningest culture, uh, the team that wins the most games, that's mm -hmm. the most competitive. Their, their job is to create a culture that's fun. And, you know, the research bears this out. We're partnered with a great organization called Positive Coaching Alliance. They talk about when you have a culture that's redefining success as effort over results, as learning, uh, continual learning over comparison to others, as mistakes are okay versus mistakes are not, you actually have control of your environment and you win more. Yeah. But that's what coaches need to be trained to do. And unfortunately, there aren't great examples of that or not examples that you uh, can readily see on television, you know, the entertainment culture that, that we live in today. Uh, there's a lot of emphasis on highlights, on winning, on self-promotion. Uh, coaches can do all the great things that, that Lauren and Paris are talking about, but they have to be given the tools to do it. Unfortunately, it's not, it's not done organically. 
Got to take a short break. When we come back, we'll continue our conversation on youth baseball. If you have calls, stay on the line. We'll get to your calls. If you'd like to call, the number is 800-433-8850. Did you have a particularly influential coach or sporting experience when you were a kid? You may also want to send us an email to kojo at wamu.org or shoot us a tweet at Kojo Show. I'm Kojo Namdi. Welcome back to our conversation on youth baseball with Tal Alter. He is the executive director of the Washington National Youth Baseball Academy. Lauren McCoy is head coach of Howard University's softball team. Paris Inman is a longtime Little League coach, organizer, and Little League parent, now responsible for community involvement with the D.C. Grays. We got an email from Julie who says, please talk about whether there is T-ball taught and played at the National Baseball Academy. National Baseball Academy. My daughter played in Virginia. We are in Washington, and I want my grandson to participate <laughs> in Ward 7. Uh, yes, there will be T-ball played. There has been T-ball played, and there will be T-ball played at the Youth Baseball Academy. Uh, we are partnered with the two little leagues that participate in uh, Ward 7 and Ward 8, Mamie Johnson uh, in Ward 7 and in Southern District in Ward 8. Mamie Johnson is going to be using our facility uh, almost exclusively this summer mm-hmm. for, uh, for or this spring, I should say, for, uh, for youth baseball and softball. And there will be uh, t-ball teams there. And then we plan to develop new programs. We're a brand new facility, so we're, we're just getting started with things. And, and demand will, will drive some of that. But uh, we absolutely plan to have t-ball opportunities at the academy this summer. Lauren, can you talk a little bit about the lessons kids get from playing these two sports? You say failure is one of the most consistent things you encounter when you play ball. Absolutely. Uh, I'll just take hitting, for example. Mm -hmm. Um, If you hit the ball three out of ten opportunities, then you're considered a great hitter. So really you have to learn how to deal with, for most people, those seven to eight times where you're unsuccessful. And, uh, you know, you learn how to deal with failure. You learn how to be resilient. Um, It's it's a lot of teamwork. It's a lot of communication. Um, We're learning that. uh, Even my collegiate players are learning that now. Um, The teams that communicate are the most successful. Um, You have to be cohesive. And and so putting all those parts together, uh, you you just really learn some incredible lessons uh, about yourself, uh, about your own abilities, about relating to people. And, uh, you know, I know personally I'm, I'm, I'm a much better person for it. Can I just make a comment on that, if, sure. if you don't mind? So Lauren talked about dealing with failure, and that's built into this game, these games. Uh, resiliency and grit uh, are two determining factors of future success that you're going to have to develop in life somehow. Sports, and especially, I think, baseball and softball, are a terrific avenue for developing those traits because of what Lauren talked about. The game uh, puts you in the spotlight, and you will oftentimes fail when you're in the spotlight, and you have to be able to deal with that. And if you can learn how to do that in a uh, safe environment, like a sports environment, which should be safe, then you can learn how to do that in life. And then the second thing is, uh, or the third thing, is relationships. And those who have relationships with adult mentors, people who are meaningful in your life, someone who helps you come along uh, into who you are, uh, then you are also more likely to be successful. It's one of the key determinate, uh, determining factors of high school graduates in low-income communities. And a coach can be that person, too. Schools are vitally important. There are a lot of resources that need to be put in schools to make them successful. But a, you know, Paris talks about uh, community organizing, the, the, uh, the cohesiveness of a community through sports. Sports can provide those opportunities for young people to be successful, more successful in school, uh, mm-hmm. in an environment where they they feel like they want to be there and they can have fun doing it. We know that as baseball was losing popularity among inner city kids, other sports, especially basketball, were gaining in popularity. Mm-hmm. Paris, part of it undoubtedly is because sports like basketball are quicker paced, carry more cultural cachet, if you mm-hmm. will. But you argue that the decline of baseball can also be interpreted as a sort of symptom of deeper problems in these communities? Um, I think um, instant gratification, meaning the instant, the the instantaneous feedback you get from some other sports does not exist in baseball. Um, uh, 
uh, at least not to the degree that it does. Meaning I put the shot up, I score. It's really simple, easy to understand. I think that's an element of it. But I think when you think about really uh, just pursuing these sports as an activity, that um, it's very difficult to get understand all the aspects of the game of baseball, throwing it up against the wall and catching it by yourself. You can learn quite a bit more about basketball as an example. I've heard several NBA players talk about when things were tough at home, when things were tough where I was, my basketball court was my sanctuary. And the implication was boy, ball, court, basket, alone. I don't know that baseball provides that same kind of opportunity. Uh, uh, I think the role of the coach in that context to teach the game, teach the beauty of the game, make sure we're translating life lessons. I'm going to say that a thousand times a day because that's, that's what I look for as a parent. I didn't get to see how my son reacted the day after he didn't do well on a class or on an assignment in class in front of the teacher. I didn't get to see that, but I got to see it hundreds of times on a baseball field. How he did when he did well. How did he do when he did poorly? How did he do when he was sitting? How did he do when he was playing? How did he do when they won? How did he react to his teammates if he, was, if he wasn't a part of an important play? I get to see a lot about his interpersonal relationships and how he's growing as a human being in addition to how his skills are progressing with baseball. And as a parent um, and as someone who that's why my kids are involved in sports anyway, not necessarily to advance to the pro level, but to learn and grow. I, I mean, I, I chose baseball for those reasons. And I, I think it's at a disadvantage also for some of the same reasons because it's more complex, more things are going on in the game, uh, and it's, it's more difficult to get that. And Lauren, you've also found that for girls, they are often channeled into different sports and mm -hmm. different extracurricular mm -hmm. pursuits mm -hmm. instead of softball. Yeah. Absolutely. I think uh, one of the major things that I found coming into the district is that a lot of girls uh, are really only given a few options, whether it be cheerleading or dance. Um, track and basketball have come up. Uh, but uh, what I'd like to see is just a greater emphasis on women in sp or young ladies in sports in general and just uh, young women knowing that they are capable of competing in athletics and not really being pigeonholed in, in any, uh, you know, one activity or another. Um, obviously, I'm biased because I love softball. Uh, so I really love to see the young ladies out there um, competing, getting in the dirt. Um, diving and, and sliding and cheering each other on. I think it's a beautiful thing. I think it's empowering. And, um, you know, I have had several coaches reach out to me on the high school level in regards to just having my girls mentor them and, and really be a role model to show them that women of color can compete uh, in the sport of softball and you can get dirty and it's okay. <laughs> on to the phones again. Here is Rosalind in Washington, D.C. Roslyn, you're on the air. Go ahead, please. Good afternoon. Um, I am also from Southern California, like your coach, and played softball my entire life there. Um, when I came to Washington, I, I went to Howard University, and I was very disappointed that 30 years ago, Howard did not have a baseball team, or didn't have a softball team. And so every summer, I would rush to go home so I could find a team to, to play with again. Um, I stayed here in Washington, had two boys, and found that they didn't really have many baseball opportunities in the area where we live. And I live right near Howard University and near Col uh, Cardoza High School. So I decided to start my own team. And that's where I met Paris, Paris Inman. We both started out together with um, the Cal Ripken League. And I'd grab kids from Ward 3, which is where my kids went to school, and I'd bring them all the way back across town, and we'd have practice three days a week. And there were kids from Bangladesh and Uruguay and the Dominican Republic and Eritrea, all in an effort to, one, as Paris said, have some community um, organizing activities, but to expose the children to, to baseball. Um, there, there was a lot of flower picking in the fields and, you know, I want to go home, I don't want to be here, but, but we did it and it succeeded. And some of our kids came back um, the following year. I would, I loved nothing more than spending, as my kids grew older, all day, all day Saturday and Sunday at tournaments, whether they were local or whether they were outside of this um, immediate area. And I just don't see that um, happening as much anymore. Um, this, as the city changes, I hope that there are more folks that really do see baseball as an important sport, as important as soccer and, and, and all the other sports. 
and I don't know what to do to make it happen. I think it definitely is um, parent-driven. Parents have to be willing to give up all Saturday, all Sunday, two or three days a week to get kids to baseball practice because there are so many lessons, as your guests have been saying, that you learn on a baseball field from leadership to learning how to be subordinate sometimes and taking direction and at some point being a good leader and a role model for those who are coming behind. Rosalind, thank, Rosalind mm-hmm. thank you so very much for your call. Rosalind mentioned Howard. I know Howard University stopped playing baseball in 2002, mm-hmm. and there are at least two of my friends, Glenn Harris and Rock Newman, who feel that they owe their lives yes. to playing baseball yes. Yes. at Howard University. But I want to talk about parenting some more, because last week there was an interesting story in the Washington Post that got us thinking about parents and their roles in kids' sports. The parents of a 16-year-old in Chantilly, Virginia, are threatening to sue her volleyball club because they say their daughter isn't getting playing time. They argue that this is important, an important time in her athletic career, that she needs to get playing time to get the attention of varsity coaches and even colleges, and that their daughter is being unfairly benched and prevented from transferring to a different team to get more playing time. I bring this up because it illustrates how high-stakes kids' sports have become in some parts of this region and perhaps reminds us that not all parental participation is, well, good parental participation. (laughs) What does good parental participation look like? Do youth sports have an adult problem? Um, oh, you're going to ask the parent. Okay. Oh, yeah? (laughs) (laughs) Well, I I think we do. I I don't think... um, well, yes, we that do that have a behavior problem. is general or normal. <laughs> it is that is a little bit of an extreme. But when I pay my money to put my kid on the travel team, and they achieve this status among their peers, and I a certain status among my peers, uh, in terms of that, do I think that that dollar buys little Johnny or little Mary playing time? Is sort of the antithesis of the point <laughs> of having them on that team in the first place. Mm-hmm. So it is, it is, it is sort of the, it is, it is, it is sort of evident. It is apparent. It goes on. I have become a part of a group of parents and we stand at games and we coach from the sidelines. <laughs> we all know better. That's just normal. I think, I think we have to be careful not to become our kids fans and agents. Mm. and to remain their parents. A healthy... Oh, sorry, parents. No, no please, go ahead. We're running out of time, yeah, so you better get it in now. A healthy <laughs> youth sports organization has a systems approach to preventing something like that from happening. Yes. I think if you look at... I don't know about that specific story, so I'd rather not comment on that, but if you look at most problems that occur between parents and coaches, parents and uh, youth sports organizers... It's, a, it's the result of a lack of clear communication and expectation setting. A healthy organization has a board that is saying, this, these are the goals of our organization. We teach life lessons. We focus on that. We try to win. Winning's good. But we focus on life lessons over the win. Uh, coaches communicate with their parents ahead of time. They say that uh, playing time is not negotiable. It's, it's based on effort and all the other things we talked about before. Uh, and then parents also understand that's what it is that they're, they're signing up for. So I think organizations can do a better job of that. Tal Alta, he is the executive director of Washington National Youth Baseball Academy. Lauren McCoy is head coach of Howard University's softball team. And Paris Inman is a longtime Little League coach, organizer, and Little League parent, and now responsible for community involvement with the D.C. Grays. Thank you all for joining us, and thank you all for listening. I'm Kojo Nandi. <laughs>